Welcome everybody to this uh, Leaders Times Fair Network session on diverse leadership in sport. My name is Piara Power. I'm the Executive Director of the Fair Network. You can look us up on fairnet.org. And this morning I'm going to be talking to two diversity and inclusion leaders in probably the biggest sports in the UK, I would argue, uh, football and cricket. I'm firstly going to be talking to Edeline John, who is the Director of International Relations, Corporate Affairs and Co-Partner for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at the English Football Association. Welcome, Edeline. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Edeline joined, Edeline joined the FA this summer after a career uh, at Morgan Stanley, KPMG, as a consultant focusing on diversity and inclusion issues. Uh, and then also we're joined, really uh, pleased to say we're joined by Sanjay Patel, who is the managing director of the 100 competition at the English Cricket Board and is the executive responsible for inclusion and uh, diversity as the executive board chairman. And Sanjay joined the ECB as commercial director, a role that he still has, from a series of senior marketing and branding management roles within the brewing industry. We won't say where Sanjay, it's a bit early in the afternoon for that, but welcome. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to talk to you both really about your organizations, which I think are um, amongst the most recognized in world sport, have incredible social, cultural, arguably political value uh, in the UK. Uh, and let's talk about EDI and leadership uh, and specifically to, to ask what your organization is doing on EDI in the area of leadership. Uh, your focus, your priority, um, your targets, if there are any. Uh, could we start with you, Edeline, on that? Yeah, sure. So um, for us as an organisation across the FA, um, many of you may be aware, but we launched a strategy back in 2018, which not just focuses on our own internal organisation, but also more broadly in terms of our outreach with um, England teams, grassroots football and inclusion programmes more broadly. But one element of that was being able to hold ourselves to account as it relates to leadership and what our organisation looks like. So we're now in the final year of that three year strategy, which will end um, at the end of the season in 20, uh, 2021. Um, and we've obviously been tracking our progress as it relates to the diversity of our leadership. For us, it's not just about the numbers piece, so there, so there has been a, a real focus on education and engagement from leadership as well. So to take one example, um, obviously the incidents over the course of this year have really spurred organisations on in terms of their momentum around certain diversity issues. And we had various members of our senior management team who engaged with employees across the organisation to really hear from them what their lived experience has been, what their challenges are that they believe are faced across the world of football and to really therefore devise a strategy about what we can continue to do better. So as we go into um, our next kind of four year strategy for us, anti-discrimination really lies at the heart of the pillar of what it is we're trying to do. Um, and that will include a, a real focus on education for our leaders um, to make sure that they are best equipped to drive forward a culture within the organization that is inclusive and enables everybody to give their best. So the, the plan, I think, until now has been called In Pursuit of Progress. Correct. That will be renewed next year, or you're going to look again at, at how that's functioned? And So, so yeah, so the In Pursuit of Progress um, current plan will end um, at the back end of, of next year, exactly as you say. What our plan is, is to continue to look at our broader FA strategy, of which anti-discrimination is going to be a key pillar amongst that. Um, and so there will be some overlap in terms of timings, but it's been really helpful to us to have our senior leadership across the firm engaging with our employees to really get a better understanding of what it is we need to drive forward. And, and just to dig a little bit deeper, I know that In Pursuit of Progress set targets in terms of numbers uh, of diverse, diverse employees, frankly, across, across the FA mm -hmm. and um, within coaching, areas of coaching that you have uh, direct remit over. Will those numbers, uh, the targets, be the way forward as well? Uh, and if, if there is a reflection on how you've done in, in meeting those targets, which you also published and, and public, 
Yeah, so our next update on In Pursuit of Progress will come out in early November. So that's where you'll have the update on our latest targets and numbers. Um, but for us across the FA, I think it's fair to say we're really focused on the attitude or the kind of mantra that what gets measured gets delivered. And so we will continue to measure our representation across the organisation um, to see what it is we're looking like and to, to help us focus our activities um, to really drive change in terms of representation, because we recognise that that is important. Okay, great, thanks. Sanjay, um, I, I've seen the, the focus that the ECB has had uh, and, and the focus that I'm told you have led, the internal reflection that you've had at the organisation, uh, also led by events over the summer, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and we saw some very public, very moving moments, uh, the Michael Holding interview on Sky, for example. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you're, you're taking that energy and framing it in terms of a plan, targets, all of that sort of day-to-day -day work. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're kind of split into, uh, I'd say, kind of two, two areas. Um, the first is what we're looking at is how, how do you create system change? Um, and I think that is how do you create cultural attitude, behaviour, mindset change throughout the whole game? And I think that is so important because you could land any of the actions that you want, but I think that is the thing that you, you really need to change within the game. Um, so the game changes itself um, as opposed to massive top-down pressure to change. So I think that's how you build long-term sustainable change um, within cricket. Uh, the areas that we're, we're currently looking at is um, leadership and governance. You know, it's an obvious area, but how do we get diversity around every single decision-making table in the game um, and that's got to start at board level uh, and we we are you know we, we're, we're not there we've got a long way to go but I think that is one of our big focuses next year in terms of uh, making significant progress around that and then that leads into your leadership teams it leads into your organizations um, whether it be ECB first class county or a county cricket board around the recreational game is how do you get the right diversity around those tables and I think that's so important for us the other area is engagement um, and education. Uh, and I think education, again, is really, really important because I think people really need to understand um, more about diversity and the reasons why you need diversity. Uh, and I think if they do, that opens up their, again, opens up their minds uh, and changes perhaps some of the attitudes and behaviours. And that is going to be a, a big strand moving forward for us. Uh, and the last thing is, you know, this is, particularly um, a kind of personal thing, but uh, visibility uh, and opportunity. Uh, and, I, and I do think, you know, I remember kind of watching sport as a kid. And if you could see somebody of colour um, playing, uh, whether it be football, rugby, cricket or whatever, you kind of had that affinity towards them because they were like you. It was like me biased. And I think for the game to show that in terms of visibility, uh, I think is really, really important because that is what's going to inspire you know, the next generation um, or female cricketers or whatever to say, actually, cricket could be a game for me. So one of the things that we're looking at is how do we dial up that sort of visibility? Um, and then the, the kind of next pillar for us is about engagement, and that's engagement of diverse communities. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the last two years around the South Asian community. Uh, we are moving towards broadening that out, um, looking at how do we engage black communities. Uh, and within that is about building trust, is about um, getting more opportunities for those communities to play, identifying talent uh, and making sure when they come into the game, there, there's an inclusive culture for them. So that's really our two big kind of strands that we're, we're focusing on. Um, I guess targets is, is a funny one for me. I think I've seen a lot of organisations have lots of big, bold, three, four, five year targets, um, and I'm not sure they hit them. Um, and I think there's a history of that happening, not only in sport, but other businesses. So the, the big things that I'm really focused on is action and outcomes. Um, I want to see action and I want to see outcomes. Uh, and I think if you do that short term, you will get to your long term targets. But unless you take care of the next three months or the next six months, then that is the most important thing for us. So we are taking, um, I won't say incremental steps, but we are, we are taking a real short-term focus in order to move this agenda. And I think if we do that, we'll comfortably hit where we want to hit in three, five years.
Um, and what are some of those markers of success then that if, you, if you're not setting big targets, what, what does success look like in the short term? You know, the, the, the way that your approach is to start making those gains quickly. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's a, there's some very very quick obvious wins that we've been doing in terms of coaching bursaries, um, giving more opportunity to black coaches within the game. Uh, I think our focus on governance uh, from a short term point of view is going to be really looking at um, how how do we make sure, particularly boards um, around cricket boards around the country, uh, have the diversity at their table, and those are the sort of short term things that we'll be focusing on between. You know, now and middle of middle of next year, uh, in order to make sure that we've, we we get some progress uh, in those spaces. Okay, and uh, you you are the the lead this within the organisation. Is this because you saw what was happening this summer, led the internal reflection, and and then wanted to meet the challenge? Because I, I think we're interested in individuals who step up to the plate, if you like. You understand that they 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 are the ones that are going to have to do this because otherwise the organisation may not get to the point where where somebody's leading. Um, no, for, for for me it was um, I guess it was a personal reflection after what happened in the the Black Lives Matters movement, and I think everyone has their different personal reflections. Right? And I think um, my personal reflection was actually wow, I, I actually think society is waking up. I think for the first time, I genuinely can see and feel that we might change um, as a as a as a society, as a sport. Um, and I think my personal reflection is: I, I've never I've never thought about myself in in positions of of influence where where um, I could change some of those things. And, and my approach has always been to try and fit in um, and almost accept what's going on, but not let that hold me back uh, and I think you know I've, I guess over the last six months I've changed a lot in terms of um, my personal reflections and I'm probably a bit embarrassed that I haven't done enough and I haven't done enough in this space uh, and I think that's why you know I, I actually put my hand up at ECB and said look I, I want to do this um, and I, I want to do this and I want to make a difference uh, and I think you know that's one of the things that again that's why I'm absolutely determined to look at action and outcome um, as, our, as our main focus rather than words and you know glossy glossy documents and big statements and all those sort of things that have happened in the past and um, what we're going to do is we're going to judge ourselves on what we deliver over the next year and then we'll, we will talk about that Great. and i think yeah. sanjay to add to that it's not even that you're going to necessarily judge yourselves i think it's fair to say in the world of sport whether we as organizations or governing bodies want to judge ourselves frankly the public will judge us in and of themselves right and so we are able to hold ourselves to account to showcase the, the positive or negative work that we're doing um and and for me beyond sort of the targets and the numerical piece is actually around the inclusive culture piece so it's how are people feeling that we as a governing body are supporting players supporting clubs supporting counties as it relates to the issues of diversity and inclusion so it, it really is beyond just the governing bodies and the work that we might be doing it's about actually how are we filtering that education down because it does then impact broader society and we do have that responsibility and so if I put my day job hat on and I've obviously been working in the inclusion and diversity space for a, for a, a number of years and a long time actually for me this isn't about me saying I take responsibility this is about the moment of recognition that this is everybody's responsibility and we all have to drive forward change it's not going to be one single individual who may be leading on the agenda or may have the title of equality and diversity manager it's actually what is everybody's action going to be to change the cultures the systems the setups that we have across the worlds of sport to make it more inclusive and to make it more diverse. You, you mentioned there, Edlin, the you hint at the sort of scope of what both of your organisations are doing. You are governing bodies, you are moral guardians of the sport, you run national teams, you run competitions, you are media rights owners with a commercial model. Um, that's a lot of space to cover. You know, so the FA will have an influence over the counties, as will the ECB, but how do you make sure that it genuinely filters down rather than, the, the, you know, how, how, how do you determine actually what a county FA looks like? I live in London. How can, can, can you ensure that the London County FA is going to have more black people in it 
uh, more Asian people, other ethnic minorities, more women? Yes, yeah, so we, um, from our perspective, we recently launched a new county FA code of governance, which includes many diversity and inclusion based provisions to really change the makeup of grassroots football to better reflect modern society. Um, and even just earlier today, I was having a conversation with a county FA who was saying, we're really driving a lot of this work in our area and we want to do more. What are some of the central um, education points or materials or things that we can leverage? And so for us, it's about saying, yes, we're a governing body and there's lots of stuff that we have centrally but where can we encourage county FAs to share best practice? Um, a lot of our county FA have inclusion advisory groups and individuals based within them who are focused on this journey. But for us, it's about saying, actually, how does this link back to what we're trying to do centrally? How are we changing things on the ground? And for us, things like a code of governance help. Um, we're also launching something similar uh, next week across the professional game, which is um, a football leadership diversity code, which focuses on changing the makeup of the supporting structures around football. So not just focusing on what's on the pitch, but actually what look, what does diversity look like off the pitch uh, surrounding football? And so for us, it's as governing bodies, we have a, a in many ways a role of privilege to set aside some codes, some direction, some focus, but we also have the opportunity to share materials, share best practice and, and join up across counties that might be doing great work or professional clubs that might be doing great work. And, and you mentioned um, the, the new code that's being launched next week or the week after. I mean, we'll, we'll put that aside for now, but it could potentially be, uh, excuse the cliche, a bit of a game changer. Um, but if we, if we go back to leadership um, and developing diverse leaders, mm -hmm. how, how are you specifically doing that? How are you creating the talent pipelines? Are you offering people training? What are the internal support mechanisms? Yeah, so it's exactly the stuff that you've just mentioned. So for us, it's looking at specific dedicated programs to support people at different junctures in their career. It's looking at bringing in mentoring programs to help people, um, particularly when they have sometimes challenging questions and you don't know who to turn to and you want to sense check it with somebody. So having those mentoring relationships, but also looking at implementing, re implementing reverse mentoring. Um, so again, educating our leaders around what it might feel like to be further down the organization and some of the challenges you might face. So for us, it's a really holistic um, approach. So we're not just focusing on bringing people through the door through our recruitment processes, but we're actually saying, how do we continue to build that diverse pipeline and to do that in a way where people are included, valued and heard with the support structures and the education that we think are important to help people progress through the firm. And Sanjay, is, is there anything that the ECB is doing in, in that regard? I mean, what, one of the things that I find really interesting around cricket, actually, is that you see coaching leaders that are Asian, mostly internationally trained, mm. but, and that's something I never see in sport, right? So uh, that's, that's one of the unique things about cricket for me, is you see people who look like you who are there calling the shots as a coach. And I don't know what, what you're doing to but both at that coaching level, but also in the management uh, and leadership space, what you're doing to, to encourage more of those sort of people to, to emerge. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, the top topic, co coaching first. Uh, look, I think we, we are fortunate in that respect is, you know, we've got a lot of great Asian uh, and black coaches to, that we can promote um, and we can make sure that, you know, they get, they get the opportunity to get to the top of the game. Um, that that is that that is also about I think supporting some of those players that have come through um, and on their journey and making sure we have early conversations with some of those players to say look would you consider a role in coaching uh, and then supporting that journey all the way through I think that's so important um, the that that's at the elite level I think there's a lot more we can do at a, a volunteer level um, and a kind of club level where. Again, it's about making sure, and I think this is about perception for me. It's about perception of cricket, um, and I think we you'll automatically get more Asian and Black coaches if they feel that there's an environment that they're going to step into that they feel comfortable in, um, and they feel that they are they are wanted and they're not excluded, and they feel that they are valued. And I think that for me again, it's a big piece around that cultural change and that education piece in order for us to do that right right through the game. Um, and I think that's you know, massively important that we do that. And, and you mentioned culture change. I, I personally think that's a, that's a big part of this area of work. Is there anything you or, or you, Adeline, at the FA are doing specifically on culture change? 
Yep. On you go. Yeah, so, so for us at, at the FA, we are um, internally looking at what our culture stands for at the moment, what we would want our culture to stand for in five years' time going forward. And a piece of work is, is happening across our teams to look at actually what does the FA this culture need to be going forward, particularly to drive and support some of this work in the equality, diversity and inclusion space. So, yeah, there are conversations happening um, and different individuals focusing on different elements. But for us, it is, is a critical priority because actually creating an inclusive culture is what is going to really help us to drive forward the benefits that we'll gain from diversity. Um, and we are absolutely acutely aware of that and therefore recognise that we have a responsibility to make sure that our culture is the way in which we want it and that it is inclusive. Yeah, we've uh, about three months ago, we actually started working uh, with PwC uh, and they had an internal look at uh, our culture at ECB uh, and they helped us think about, you know, what does an inclusive culture actually mean? What does it look like? Uh, and we, track, we, we kind of surveyed that in terms of where are we on that journey? So I think we've got a very clear understanding of kind of where we are. So um, the situation analysis is clear. What we now need to do is think about the five or six actions that we're going to put in place to start moving that culture culture forward. Um, and again, I kind of keep coming back to it, but that education piece is just so important. Um, and I think the more, the more you educate, I think the more that people understand and the more that people understand means the more that people, people's mindset and attitudes and behaviors will change. And I think that is kind of, uh, you know, a big strand in our kind of inclusive culture uh, for ECB and then how we then translate that into the wider game again is something that, that we need to work out. And I think I completely agree with that, Sanjay. We're quite similar in terms of looking at that education piece more broadly. So obviously, you know, it's Black History Month in October and everybody has been focused particularly because of the Black Lives Matter momentum. But we've taken that as an opportunity to not just educate individuals on some of the historical elements of Black history, but also to share lived experiences, learn stories of colleagues, um, and also to actually roll out training. So unconscious bias training is, is being rolled out for us across all of our employees across the FA during Black History Month. And we very much see this as not just a moment in time or not just a month of celebration when we want to educate people, but actually we want that to be ongoing and we want people to be continuing to enhance their knowledge in exactly the way that you say, Sanjay, because actually it's with that increased awareness and understanding that you will be a bit more mindful of your behaviours and your actions and how they might impact others. Okay, that's great. Now this all too brief chat uh, is coming to a close. But So one final question for you both and, and that is a standard question about looking forward uh, looking forward five and then ten years so i want to hear from you if, if i can about what are the changes that that you think you will see uh, in the fa and in football in the ecb and in cricket in the next five years and the next year, ten, ten years and if you can try try not to be too optimistic because I'm an optimist, but you know, sometimes we, we, we can talk ourselves into situations that, that are not going to be realized. So a realistic assessment of where we might be in five and 10 years, please. Edlin. Can we... I go first? Sure. Um, so I think for, for us as, as the FA, we, for the next five, 10 years are really committed to delivering a, a game that's free from discrimination. Um, I mentioned that we're currently developing our strategy, which takes us up to 2024. Um, and this will feature a, a suite of anti-discrimination activities ranging from education and sanctions to various marketing campaigns and infrastructure uh, changes across our venues, such as Wembley Stadium. We really want to ensure that we can do everything in our power over the next, you know, four or five years um, to deliver a game that, that everybody feels that they can be part of. Um, and part of that for us is obviously working with um, the teams, both from a professional and county level. And, and I mentioned and alluded to the code that we'll be launching later, but that is another key part of it for us because that is about not just looking at what the makeup is of individuals on the pitches, but making sure that the support structures around the game, senior leadership, team operations, coaches are actually more reflective of the society that we live in today. And so for us bringing in that code and, and watching that change in transition, um, will be a means by which the game begins to change to be more representative of society. Um, and hopefully with the continued education and culture change, we will have a more inclusive sport for everybody. That's one of our key goals. Great. And Sanjay, you at the ECB cricket? Yes, yeah, so I, I, 
I, I think this question is probably linked to how quickly is society going to change within the next five or 10 years? Um, and how quickly is it going to move? Um, and, I, and I do feel, you know, in the last sort of six months, there's been a, a seismic change and shift um, in terms of this space and this topic and, and people's awareness levels of it and the need to change. So I actually think we're going to go through a, a, a pretty quick change in terms of um, society and so on. But that will take time. Um, and of course, it will take time to kind of flow through. In terms of cricket, I, look, pretty simple for me. I mean, I, I, I'd love a situation in five or ten years where you know you, you will you'll go to every single cricket board in this country and you will see diversity. You'll see female representation. You'll see BAME representation. You'll see a club that is full of um, different kids from different backgrounds, um, and that might not be even ethnic backgrounds. It might be backgrounds where um, you know lower social demographic backgrounds, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just cricket is open for everybody. Um, I'd love to see a situation where, you know, in future years, the, the, the senior leadership roles of the ECB are completely balanced. Um, and that would be a great thing to see. And then, you know, continuing that onto the pitch where we have strong representation uh, of BAME within our professional game, uh, and also within within our England teams, uh, and then you know I'd love to see a chance where, and I think we will actually see this as where women's cricket goes from strength to strength, um, and in five and ten years' time, it, it is um, you know getting as big as men's cricket, um, and I, I don't I don't see why it shouldn't do, uh, and I think that's the journey that we're on. So I'd love to see that as well. Sanjay, so, ideal case scenario is in five, ten years' time, none of us are even needing to have conversations about diversity, right? Because it's just part and parcel of the runnings of our sport and the runnings of society, whereby actually people are respected, valued, and listened to, um, yeah. irrespective of, of, of their differences. So that's, I appreciate, you know, you said, please don't go too big and don't go too kind of ambitious in terms of focus. But for me, ideal case scenario, I say to people is where we've been able to talk all of the diversity and inclusion consultants, which would include include me in terms of my previous life, completely out of a job. That's the ideal case. OK, great. That's amazing. Thank you very much for your insights. Thank you, Edlin John of the Football Association. Thank you, Sanjay Patel of the English Cricket Board. I think there's a lot there for our audience to, to take away. Have a great day. Thank you.